Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Lieutenant General Mary Legier, United States Army retired, and Managing Director for National and Defense Intelligence Business at Accenture. Well, It's always nice to have a relative in the audience to start spontaneous applause. Thank you, Chuck. And thank you, Afsia, and thank all of you for joining us again this afternoon to continue what has been a really fruitful discussion. I'd like to begin by thanking Afsia and Inza for every year bringing together the team that really does work together to ensure we have the best solutions for national security. For those of us who have been privileged enough to be here for a, a day and a half, listening to the discussions between our government and intelligence community leaders, academia and industry. You understand that the importance of this teamwork of understanding the true challenges and the true priorities is what's gonna make the difference in ensuring that these ladies and gentlemen who represent this great intelligence community have the answers that they need. So thank you for being here. Thank you to AFSIA and thank you to INSA for this important annual gathering. Um, I am proud today to represent Accenture Federal, and as we say in Accenture, the beginning of great solutions is understanding what your customers need. If we're going to help the intelligence community accelerate its progress as a digital force and a digital community, if we're going to help the intelligence community take advantage of the great advances in cyber defense, the great advances in artificial intelligence, automation, and predictive intelligence, we have to hear first from the customer to have them explain the problem from their perspective. And so today, I know everybody's been excited all day, but today we're very excited to have this esteemed group, a very good looking group, a um, very qualified group. We had a vote who had the best hair, I'm gonna leave it to you as to who that is. Uh, but we are thrilled today to have the leaders of our, our national and defense intelligence organizations uh, for a discussion about their priorities and challenges. And it's my pleasure to get to do the introduction. And I've practiced all their names. So left to right, or right to left, representing the National Reconnaissance uh, Office, uh, Frank Calviello is the Deputy Director. Representing the, the Defense Intelligence Agency, Deputy Director, Director Melissa Driscoll. Representing uh, the, the men and women of the National Geospatial Intelligence um, Organization or Agency, Director Robert Cardillo, whose nickname I've been told to say is Il Jefe Magnifico. <laughs> uh, representing, and, he, and Admiral Rogers has the most jobs, so I always write it down, because when you get it wrong for a four star, you'll hear about it later. Uh, but representing the United States Navy, great football team till lately, the commander, and probably, honestly, probably again. But like Red Sox fans, if we just get one victory every 15 years, we're pretty content. <laughs> uh, but representing, uh, obviously, the men and women of uh, United States Cyber Command, uh, our commander of U.S. Cyber Command, the director for the National Security Agency, the chief of our central security office, I got them all, a service, Admiral Mike Rogers. Um, and representing, and, and, our, and our, I think this is our first, our first appearance with us at INSA. You'll be here for the next 20 years, so get comfortable. <laughs> uh, representing the great men and women of the FBI, um, Director Christopher Ray. Now, the man that we've chosen uh, to um, lead the discussion today as a stranger to none of us who read great journalism, uh, Mr. David Ignatius who is somebody whose name I practice. He says, as a good Catholic, I shouldn't have had to ask, but I did. Um, uh, obviously, uh, contributes regularly to the national security education of our country through his work with the Washington Post. And did want me to mention, the author of 10 spy novels. Um, if you look under your chair, the 10th one is there for you. No, I'm kidding. But it's coming out, and I got, a, I got a brief look at it. It's called The Quantum Spy. It's available just before Christmas, so you could buy it. And what's interesting is there is a character that is, is slightly resembles Admiral Rogers. His protagonist is the guy that slightly resembles Director Cardillo. <laughs> and if you really can't think of anything else to buy yourself, that would be it. So... Gentlemen and ladies, thank you so much for taking the time. We can imagine how busy you are, how difficult the challenges that you have. We thank you for your commitment to INSA and AFSIA. We thank you for commitment to this summit. David, it's all yours. Thank you. General Legere, thank you. Authors love. 
we we love book plugs and the, the any reference to Christmas and something that makes a good Christmas gift we're especially happy to have. I am honored to be asked to conduct uh, this conversation that we're going to draw you into uh, in a f in a few minutes. I'm going to ask each of the directors and, and deputy directors for an opening assessment of their agencies, and then I'll follow up with a little bit of. Uh, detail, and then we'll go to some general uh, discussion and then uh, turn to you. I want to uh, begin with our uh, first uh, public appearance by the new FBI director, Director uh, Ray, and I want to ask the simplest uh, question, how's it going? Uh, you're, you're, you're back at Justice, you're overseeing an agency that's certainly uh, not lacked for being in the news. Uh, give us give us a sense of what you're finding, what surprises you, what's working, what you what you want to fix. Uh, well, I, at first I would say I'd love to be here when I still haven't figured anything out, since I'm only a month into the job. So I'm, hopefully I will be able to answer as many of your questions as I can. Um, I think for me it took me about 10 seconds of walking back in the FBI building to remember how much I missed it and how excited I was to be back uh, in the fold. Um, you know, walking around the building, meeting people. I've tried to be meeting with, you know, every division, trying to get out in the field. Uh, it's been inspiring and it reminded me, you know, why I loved the place so much when I worked there before. Um, I would say in most, for the most part, fewer surprises than not. Uh, the things that were great about the Bureau still are great about the Bureau. People are mission focused. No matter what job they have, they're very uh, passionate about it. They are determined to be the best at what they do uh, and they cover the waterfront. Uh, they're very detail oriented uh, and they bring the kind of integrity uh, that I always found so attractive when I was working with them as a line prosecutor and then later uh, in Maine Justice after 9-11. Uh, some of the things that I've noticed that have been uh, surprising uh, and encouraging are sort of the strides that have been made since I left. It's a little bit like the analogy of when, you know, when you're watching your own child grow every day, you don't really notice how tall they're getting. But when you see somebody else's kid, you know, we've all had the experience where you say, oh my gosh, when I last saw you, you were only this tall, and now look at you, you know. To me, there's a little bit of that at the Bureau right now in a few areas in particular that I would call out, although there are many that I, I won't be able to cover in this time. But the biggest one that's relevant to this group um, is the integration of intelligence into the overall mission. Um, and I think that at this point, people almost start to take it for granted. But even back in 2001 to 2005, I would say the FBI in many ways was sort of the ugly duckling of the intelligence community. And now the sophistication of the products that are generated, the degree to which intelligence analysts are integrated with case agents in everything from the basic training to the day-to-day -day cadence of the place uh, is really remarkable. And you can see how intelligence uh, is driving everything that they're doing in a way that I think is formidable. Uh, so the strides that have been made, uh, I think in that uh, department in particular, I give you know, huge marks to both my predecessors in, in kind of pushing that along. Um, I think another area that uh, pleasantly surprised me uh, is in the area of partnerships. You know, the degree to which uh, the FBI is now partnering with state and local law enforcement, the other members of the intelligence community, the Five Eyes, et cetera. Those, were, those things were all happening back in the early 2000s, but it was much bumpier, much more episodic, um, much more inconsistent. And now it's become much more of a, a way of life, day in, day out, uh, in a way that I think is impressive. It doesn't mean there's room for improvement, but it's, it's striking. And probably the third area I would mention, I think, is um, which is a challenge, is on the technology front. I do think as exciting as some of the strides that we've made in the technological arena in terms of countering the threats, and I assume we'll get time to talk more about the threats uh, in a little bit here, um, I think that our adversaries and their progress in technology um, in my humble view, is exceeding our ability to keep up with it. And so I think that's a place where 
we really are going to have to buckle down uh, and work collaboratively in a way that we're not quite yet, uh, both different agencies, the private sector, et cetera, or I think we've got a, a very, very scary road ahead of us in terms of the, the role of technology for our adversaries. So those are just a few observations off the top of my head. Let me ask you a, a, a question about an investigation that is one of many, many that you have underway, but it's one that the country is, is focused on, and that's the investigation you're conducting uh, into Russian interference in the 2016 election campaign. And I, I want to ask you, just as directly as I can, whether you feel confident and comfortable that in conducting that investigation, you're free of any interference or pressure from the White House or from the President. I have, I can say very confidently that I have not detected any whiff of interference with that investigation. Um, I have enormous respect for former Director Mueller, who I got to work with you know, almost daily in the early 2000s um, as a consummate professional, uh, and he's really running that investigation, but we, the FBI, have dedicated agents to it and other support to it, uh, so there's a great group of people working on it, uh, and I have confidence in them to be able to do their job professionally. Uh, the FBI also has a counterintelligence mission, which is more of a forward-looking mission, just more geared towards prevention, that is, prevention of Russian interference in, say, a future election. And so there's overlapping uh, mission there, uh, and I'm impressed with the strides that have been made on that front as well. So thank you. Thank you for responding to that uh, directly. Let me turn that to Admiral Rogers. Uh, Admiral, your uh, area of cyber, cyber uh, offense and defense is at the center of concern, I would think, for everyone in this audience. You're finishing up uh, a, a tour uh, at, at, uh, at NSA, uh, which gives you a... Are you finishing up a tour? <laughs> <laughs> you know something? Well, you're, you're <laughs> nearing, nearing the, the final lap of a tour. Um, so, or, so, or so they tell you. Yeah, that's right, or so David tells me. <laughs> so the, the simple question I want to put to you is, um, tell us uh, what you've learned in your time running, running at NSA. Tell us uh, how you think your agency is doing. Tell us what this audience needs to know about, about your requirements, uh, the issues you're looking to the private sector to help you solve. So after three and a half years as the director of NSA, the fundamentals remained unchanged. Two incredibly important missions, generating foreign intelligence insight as to threats and concerns to the security of our nation, that of our friends and allies, as well as the safety of our citizens. And the second aspect of our mission, generating information assurance and computer network defense insights that help ensure the cybersecurity of the nation and those of our friends and allies. And the second fundamental to me that's unchanged is the great men and women of the organization, which is the best part of the day for me. I just get to deal with incredibly motivated men and women who, quite frankly, could be doing a lot of other things, making a whole lot more money, um, but who believe in what they're doing. And that, as I was just, I literally just did a global town hall with the workforce this morning earlier, and one of the things I said to them was, <coughs> With a motivated workforce that's doing something that matters, I hope every day you are walking out and coming into work as I am, feeling incredibly motivated and real good about what we're doing and how much it matters. And I just wanted to say thanks to that workforce. Um, when I look, step back, hey, what are the challenges that I see out there? The positive side for us is we continue to generate great insight. The flip side is it continues to be more difficult to do it. It's a tougher set of challenges. Again, with a great workforce, you can overcome lots of things. Um, the power of partnership remains incredibly important. It's one of the things I like about venues like this. All of us and our organizations, as well as a much broader set of partners, both here in the United States, within the government, within the private sector, within the international arena. It's our ability to bring together these power, these partnerships to generate outcomes. That's a real strength for the IC as a whole. It's a cornerstone of the whole SIGINT global enterprise that NSA is a part of. When I look at the challenges, how do you sustain a, a workforce? How do you keep it with the skill sets that it needs for a challenge set that keeps evolving, keeps changing? 
as you're looking to hire people. I was just reviewing the fiscal year 18 hiring plan for us. And I'm thinking to myself, are we making the right bets? The skill sets that we're hiring today, are we going to need them 5, 10, 20 years from now? Guys, this is the way we have to be thinking. It can't be just about what do we got to do in the next year. And so are we making the fundamental investments that are positioning us for success in the future and so that we continue to generate the knowledge that the nation's counting on? The cyber piece, I, I would tell you, I've been doing cyber on and off. I've been a SIGINER for about 30 some odd years. I've been a cyber individual for about 15. It's the toughest problem set I've probably ever worked. Um, there's no civil bullet, there's no single solution. So the power is, how do you bring together these partnerships, do it in a sustained level, and how do you get out of the normal traditional, hey, this is purely a government role, this is purely the private sector, this is purely commercial versus no, this is something public that is not going to work for us here. I truly believe that this is a national security challenge and it takes a national security approach, harnessing the total power of our nation and all of its elements as to how we're going to deal with this. You and I have, have talked uh, recently at ASMA about uh, Section 702. And I, I know that you are deeply concerned about reauthorization of, of that. Uh, and perhaps you could explain to this audience, as, as you uh, think about the future and do your contingency planning, what, what would be the consequences of that not being reauthorized in terms of your ability to collect intelligence? So I, um, uh, the, the Vice President of the United States visited yesterday at Fort Meade. We spent some time with him, and one of the things I said to him was, sir, I know of no ability that this organization has to replace that which is we're able to access because of the authority under 702. Sir, if this, were be, if this was removed and it was not reauthorized, it currently is set to expire the 31st of December 2017, I can't overcome that. If you look at 702, um, I mean, it generates a significant segment of NSA's ability to generate insights on counterterrorism, counterproliferation, what nation states and other actors are doing. Over the course of the next 90 days or so before the authority expires, we and others will be part of a broader dialogue attempting to educate and inform as our Congress makes up its mind as to what they are comfortable with, and that's their role. I, I certainly understand that. We'll be trying, we'll be part of a broader dialogue designed to engender a greater sense of understanding about, so just what is this statutory authority that you keep referring to as 702? That's the section of the FISA Act that enables us to, to conduct collection overseas, overseas against non-U.S. persons, non-U.S. persons, for a series the law outlines out a specific set of purposes. And we have to show the court, because we do this based on an authority then granted to us specifically by the court, um, and we have to show how we're complying with the law. I would just, there's very valid concerns, which I certainly understand. We go to great lengths to ensure the protection of our citizens' privacy and their rights. We acknowledge that in the course of the conduct of 702, we will undoubtedly run into U.S. person information, which is why we have put several protections in place from a court of law to congressional oversight to who can access the data to how we're allowed to use the data to ensure that we are providing appropriate protections. We take that very seriously. That's part of the law. It's something we believe in. And so we're going to be working our way through this, but I just think it would be a truly significant act, not, not in our nation's best interest, were we to withdraw the legal authority currently granted to us under Section 702. Uh, Director Cardillo, I want to ask you similarly to give us an overview of how things are going uh, at the NGA, at your agency, uh, with your very uh, specific uh, mission set and a changing environment that you have to deal with that affects many people in the audience. Well, thanks, David. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here on stage again uh, with my uh, colleagues and friends. Um, it's also uh, always a privilege to be able to represent the women and men of the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. Um, also appropriate, I think, that I follow Mike because uh, one way to describe where our profession, my agency, is right now is to use an analogy I think that NSA has successfully been through. And if you think of uh, the NSA mission set as the world transitioned to a digital network, uh, a, a, a cyber connected network, 
that created great opportunity for business and education and, and, and social use and, 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 and population uh, uh, information. Um, NSA had to change its mindset about how to engage. Uh, Mike just talked about some of the challenges of that engagement, but uh, how to engage in a way that lifts up the value that NSA provides from mission insight and protection. And uh, while it's not a perfect analogy, in many ways geospatial intelligence is going through a like transition. And so where we once did our work with government access, government security, government ownership, government control, uh, we now live in a world in which there, the barriers have been reduced to admission to that field, which again is a good thing for many parts of our society. Uh, increased players, partners, um, uh, opportunities. The challenge I then have is how do I advance our value proposition in a flatter, um, more disrupted world? And so this room is one example. Um, never could do our job without the partners that are in this room. That's always been true. And the mission partner to my far left uh, on the government side at the NRO. But the fact that you all now bring access to, understanding of, algorithmic uh, approaches to these new data sets and this new connectivity to create that understanding and that insight we never could do it alone is even more true uh, today, will be even more true tomorrow. So uh, as, as, uh, as Mike does, I uh, have these uh, key resources, our human capital, our, the expertise that's within the agency. Our challenge is how do we create the right agility to work with you? How do we declutter our acquisition process to enable your innovation to get to my desktop sooner? How do we uh, lift the skill set uh, of a workforce that needs to be more data savvy and, and um, uh, computationally knowledgeable in a way that again provides advantage on the other side. Uh, the fundamentals haven't changed. Uh, we call it locational dominance. That's what we seek to provide. Um, it's just if we, if we hold on to how we did it in the past, and, and not advance, I think we put ourselves at risk as an agency, that's less important. We put our mission at risk with respect to protecting the, the country and our allies. So, so we're in a similar transition. Uh, I love to learn the lessons of my friend here, uh, uh, good and otherwise, because uh, as I said, I think there's much for us uh, to benefit from the transition that Mike's been through. As you said, uh, you had a near monopoly on uh, GeoInt, uh, and that's now exploded as you have, uh, what, 190 satellites uh, overhead uh, acquiring constant real-time uh, imagery. Uh, question that I'm sure a lot of us are curious about is, how do you uh, keep an advantage for the United States? How do you uh, make it possible for policymakers to, uh, as, as, as I've heard you say, go, go into a, a what hopefully is an unfair fight because they have advantages that nobody else does. How do you get those advantages in this new world? Uh, that's, the, that's the right question. Um, I'll start and finish the answer with our people. Um, because when data is commoditized and access is more open and the barriers to what used to be exclusive are reduced, one could imagine that things could get more equal, right? And uh, we don't want to be in the equal business, we want to be in the advantage business. And so part of the answer is, is our expertise. So that's the application of, that's the meaning of, that's the insight that's created by the lack of data. Uh, what's, what isn't happening that tells us of someone's intention or future activity? Uh, again, this room comes into play because uh, even in a, even in, well, especially in a flat and open world, uh, the person that can most agilely apply the innovation that you create in a time frame that's an increment faster than that adversary, uh, that's how you sustain advantage. So again, that goes to agility. Uh, but, at the, but at the end of the day, um, what hasn't changed uh, and what won't change is that uh, it will come down to the, uh, uh, the software that's up in the, in the head. That is the 
the, the meaning of the data as it as it as it comes together, the um, the implication uh, of a corollary of a bit of information that Mike picks up and that that, that Melissa picks up that creates a moment of operational time or decision space, hopefully both, that gives that decision maker um, the advantage when he or she needs it. And that's the only definition of success. I turn to Deputy Director Driscoll and ask you, uh, you, you run or help run uh, an agency that uh, is consuming the intelligence that's provided by your colleagues on the stage, also in analyzing it. Uh, making it useful for, for policymakers. Give us a, an overview of how things are going at DIA, uh, the issues that you're most focused on. Um, I have to say, and I think um, my boss, General Stewart, would agree, I think things are going well. Um, I'm, uh, we're very excited about, that we talked about partnerships, you talked about it, uh, General Rod Admiral Rogers, you talked about it. Um, the partnerships are important, we're trying to build stronger partnerships. Um, I think what's interesting for us is that we found we've had to, to refocus, not de-emphasize, but refocus more of our energy, not so much on the counterterrorism, but more on what the director considers to be our no-fail missions, the four plus one, Iran, China, North Korea, Russia, and violent extremists. So we've had to rededicate ourselves, and that has spread us rather thin, but we're committing to that. And what we found is, from an intelligence perspective for an all-source organization, um, we've been able to kind of come as you are uh, to conflicts and, and kind of rally and pull things together. But as we face these uh, peer, near peer ad adversaries, we're not going to be able to do the come as you are. So we've got to develop a, a foundational intelligence, a solid foundation, and continue to add to that foundation. <clears throat> and that what that means is taking advantage of and dealing with the, the data. You talked a lot about data, and it is. We have to become much more data centric, much more savvy in how we handle data the volume of data, the velocity of the data, the variety of data. So, so my colleagues are great at, at sending it our way, both on the classified and unclassified. Um, and there's, there, you know, there are secrets there that we got to find. It's how do you find the secrets? And that's part of what, um, for our analysts and for our collectors to take advantage of that, to cue them to the next target, to where they need, they need to go. Um, so there's opportunity um, uh, here, obviously, and I said we're recommitting ourselves to this. One thing I will say, though, is as we, and we're looking at algorithmic analysis, um, artificial intelligence, machine learning, what we're finding is we're having to examine what's the role of the human, what's the role of the human analyst in this. Now, a lot of people talk about this, but really it, it's kind of scary for our analysts and for some of our, our other folks. But, uh, but in the business end as well, not just on the core analytic collection end, but what's the role? What do we look like in 10 years? So some of that, that's some of what we're doing right now as well, is trying to imagine what does the analyst look like, the environment look like in 10 years? And even as we try to define it, does that make it obsolete even, even as we try to define it? So what does it look like? And then what's the value of the human being? So I'm actually fascinated by that. Where does the value, where does the human being add value? And that's something we're trying to explore. I think that and, that, and that will also drive us to making decisions about the kind of people that we hire and draw in the future. We found that a lot of the people we bring in now, very smart, very inquisitive, a lot, you know, strong work ethic, and tech savvy, and they know how to deal with data. So I'm not sure we have to radically change the kind of people we hire, we bring in, whether contract or, or government. But I think we need to give them a, a realistic expectation of the environment they're likely to have to o operate in. So I talked to all of our new folks about, yeah, you've got to leave your cell phones at the door. And you're not going you're gonna to come in, you're not going to be able to download every app you want. And, and so we try to help them feel like it's not so restrictive and, and create ways to bring in and innovate and expose them to the, the art of the possible. And that's, that's one of the, the big challenges we have, is um, to keep that creativity alive, um, to create that environment. We're doing some things on, in that regard. But what is the role of humans? So what I found, and I sit down with analysts, and I sit down with technical collectors and human collectors, and what I find personally is most valuable is those that can ask the smart questions, who can interact with that data and say, well, what about this? And what could this be? And what if I move this? And, and so that's, that's really what we're looking for. And then the tools let them do this fairly intuitively. So one of the frustrations I have, and I'll tell you all right now, is somebody shows up with a tool, and they're going to show me this wonderful tool, and i got to pay a gazillion dollars to teach people constantly how to use it. That's not really helpful. 
it, it, um, it kind of stifles the creativity of our analysts. They're not going to play with it. And I constantly ask the analysts, are you playing? Playing with some of this data? How are you playing with it? Show me how. Let me play. Can I play with it? I'm an old lady. And can I play with it? If I can, anybody can. So, so old lady, but I'm old enough. Um, so, uh, so how do we, how do we uh, you know, deliver those things that a smart cookie can, can work with and can play with? and continue to, um, to iterate that as well. So those are some of the things. And finally, one of the things we are uh, having to look at as a business is what are those things that we need to divest ourselves of? We're just, uh, we have had a lot of things lashed onto us, stapled onto us, Velcro, Velcroed onto us over time. It was a great idea at the time. Probably don't need to keep doing that. How do we start to make those smart? And it's business decision, from my perspective anyway. Um, those things that we either don't lead the industry in, it's not really something that logically falls in our mission set as a military combat sport agency. So, uh, so that's another area. So I've kind of bounced around, but there's a I lot. ask you about a, a specific danger that uh, affects uh, many of your fellow panelists and also is of interest uh, to, to the audience, and, th and that is the threat that the DIA assesses to space-based assets. Reading uh, General Stewart's uh, worldwide threat assessment in May was striking when he talked about Russia and China. The language that he used about the seriousness of their uh, efforts to develop uh, anti-space uh, weapons. And I, so I want to ask you to draw that out a little bit and, and give us a sense of, of how DIA looks at this problem uh, and what thoughts you have for this audience. Sure. Well, um, there's no doubt. The Russians and the Chinese see space as um, an area that they absolutely want to um, challenge the, the U.S. in, in that domain. And the effect it can have, some say cat catastrophic, I believe that's true, in terms of our command and control, of our weapons systems, or our intelligence systems, um, if they were successful. And, and I want to talk about both on orbit and on terrestrial front. So from our perspective, we're interested in both, both environments. Uh, on orbit, it's a very hostile inaccessible environment, how do we understand what's going on and how they view that space um, and what they need to do. From our perspective, we also, and it's an all-source agency, so we're interested in, and some tech collection as well, um, understanding what their capabilities are both in terms of reversible and irreversible. Um, when would they employ one over the other and, and along that whole spectrum? Um, how good are they? What are their intent uh, to do that? What would push them to that? Um, obviously, we work with our colleagues here. One of the things we've done recently, though, to, to answer part of this is we've stood up um, an integration, and this is continuing our, our, our efforts to integrate collectors and analysts together, all source analysts, into a space counter space uh, office organization to try to draw more focus uh, and understand not only what they want to do to us and how they, but also understand to some extent how they, their dependency and their vulnerabilities. Um, we need to understand that. Um, particularly dependency in terms of uh, military conflict. What is the dependencies? We can try to mirror it, but we really need to get some more insight into that. So De Deputy Director Covelli, uh, finally the same question to you. How's it going at the NRO? Uh, how, do you, how do you think about your future challenges? Uh, you, uh, like uh, NGA, are facing a world where there's an awful lot of uh, commercial uh, capability out there doing what you used to do uh, pretty exclusively. How do you deal with that, and, and what does the future look like? Let me start first with the with the NRO itself. So uh, I'll tell you, it's an absolutely great time to be at the NRO. Now, now, first of all, when you look at our mission in terms of building and operating the nation's spy satellites, you don't get any cooler than that. So we've been very fortunate to be able to attract an amazing workforce of scientists and engineers and other folks that support our mission out that way. Last year, um, I'm sorry, this year, actually in, in 17, we've already had two launches of two new assets to provide amazing capabilities for the nation. Uh, the one back on May 1st was our first time on the SpaceX ride on a rocket, which was a phenomenal success. We've got three launches coming up this fall, so we're excited about the, all the additional capacity and capabilities that, and new features that we're adding to the fight for the intelligence community. If I look at my acquisitions on, that I'm developing, my next generation of satellites, all those acquisitions are going amazingly well. Uh, my scorecard from the DNI shows that I am green on cost, schedule, and technical performance for all my major acquisitions, so that's a big success for us. We received last November our eighth clean consecutive uh, financial, clean financial audit. We are the only IC agency to have a clean audit, and we're working on our ninth one this year, so that's a, a big deal in terms of 
proper stewardship of the taxpayers dollars so we're really proud of that we continue to invest research and development almost every year on new capabilities and that's paid multiple dividends for us and on new on new features for our satellites and our ground systems we've actually put together a comprehensive strategy for protection and resiliency of our space assets and our ground assets are in the middle of implementing that. That's a really critical point, David, that if we're not there for the fight, then we're worthless. So we're going to be there for the fight, both our space and our ground systems. Um, we formed an amazing partnership with, uh, with General Hyten at STRATCOM and General Raymond at Air Force Space Command at the National Space Defense Center. Both, so the partnership between the intelligence community and the Department of Defense, and that's a phenomenal teamwork event across both those all those organizations to actually be able to do indications and warning, understand threats that are out there, and take preventive action, or protective action together as a, as a unified nation. And then finally, you know, the, our systems are, are, are amazingly flexible and agile, and we're able to provide coverage anytime, anywhere throughout the globe, and it's an amazing opportunity to support the intelligence community. Now let me, you wanted to follow up on a question about commercial. I, 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 I do, it's a, it's a question similar to what I asked uh, Director Card Cardillo. Uh, in this uh, world where overhead imagery, uh, you, you know, you, you can buy, buy and sell it, uh, how does the NRO keep its, uh, I'll say, special sauce? So it is actually an opportunity. Um, we've been building and taking pictures from space since the 60s. So if commercial could actually pick that up now, 50 years later, and actually do basic imagery resolution from, uh, from low Earth orbit, then you know what? That frees us up as a nation to be investing in the more exotic things that commercial will never do. Capabilities that will actually give us an edge in the future. So I'm actually excited about the opportunities by folks like Planet Labs, by uh, Digital Globe and others. As we can buy more of that commercially as a service, it frees up dollars to invest in the more exotic stuff that we should be doing. And so it's an opportunity for the nation. So I, I want to uh, turn to uh, questions from the audience. Um, you uh, have the procedure, I think, for submitting uh, questions, which I can see on my iPad here. And uh, the, the first was one that was of special interest to me, uh, and it involves insider threats. Um, we have all uh, seen a uh, disturbing hemorrhage of information, the most secret information from our intelligence agencies and, and contractors. And I, I want to ask you how uh, your agencies are dealing with this, and in particular, how you can do better in dealing with insider threats without creating a work environment that is so rigid that you'll end up driving away your most uh, creative people. Maybe Admiral Rogers. Uh, I know you've thought about this. You could lead off, and I, then I'd be interested in other, other thoughts. So the first thing to me is it starts out with a dialogue with the workforce. As I said, I, I literally did a global town hall with the workforce coincidentally this morning, and this is one of the topics I raised. I said, let's have a discussion for a little bit about what we're doing and why we're doing it and how important this is to you and our organization as a whole and what I think the implications are for us in the future. The, the biggest thing to me is... Um, it is both technical and a series of changes and improvements, but never underestimate the cultural challenge of this. Part of that cultural challenge is, and I, I have said this to our overseers, I, I've said this to leadership, we gotta find a balance here. If the price of security becomes that we drive away the very men and women that generate value in the first place, we now have a self-induced mission kill. That's a bad place for us to be. By the same token, you don't want the opposite end. Well, everything is about generating maximum outcomes, so security is very secondary to your objective. Uh, I reject that. So it's how do we find a bit of a middle ground, but how do we also talk to the workforce, which is one of the things I, I did today about, so what are the expectations of an intelligence professional in the 21st century? And what is your role as an individual who has been granted access to incredibly sensitive information that if it were placed in the wrong hands, not only endangers the security of our nation, but potentially also has an impact on our citizens. That is not where we as intelligence professionals want to be. Our nation grants us great authority and great capability because it is confident that we are generating value and that we are doing it in a way that complies with the law and also ensures that we are mindful of the privacy and the rights of every one of our individuals. And so I try to, when we're talking about the insider threat piece, I try to frame it in those terms. The other thing I urge is, 
I get a lot of people who will say, well, the answer is this is all about contractors. And I'm going, stop. Go back. I can tell you uniforms who have compromised the security of information. I can name the organization, FBI agents, CI individuals, NSA people. Um, there is not an organization that hasn't had this challenge. It is government civilians, junior and senior military contractors. The answer is not that it's one particular class or type of individual. Um, the answer is how do we institutionally and structurally step and ask ourselves, guys, how do we make some fundamental change here? And the last point I would make is we need to do this on a risk-based approach. What is the data that is really of the most greatest concern to us, that represents the greatest potential vulnerability if it were exposed? Do we want the same approach, the same level of, um, if you will, uh, trade-offs with that which is incredibly important where it be to compromise versus information which while it is sensitive, the reality is, look, it would not have the same kind of impact. Guys, be, be leery of a one-size-fits-all approach to doing business here. We need to step back and take a risk-based approach to how, how we're doing this. So that's kind of where we are. Turn to Director uh, Ray. An another word for insider threats is leaks, um, uh, something the FBI thinks about. Um, Speak to this uh, issue as, as you think about it. If you want to talk about the, the balance that people in my business w worry about uh, of, of uh, too constricting uh, ap approach to information, I'd be interested in, in, in that. But to, just tell us, as you come into the FBI, how do you think about this insider threat problem? So this is a topic that's a, a very high priority for us and something we take very seriously. As Mike says, you know, every agency's had its issues, uh, and I think we all learn from the experiences that each other have had. Uh, we try to talk about it very much in terms of, a, you know, what is the culture of the organization? There's a shared culture of security, which is a part of who we are, and, and shared accountability. Um, we've created as a reflection of how seriously we take it, a insider threat center, which is designed, and that was recently just elevated uh, to have more executive oversight, you know, kind of in the leadership of the FBI. The focus is on trying to identify sort of indicators, stressors, patterns, uh, behavioral signs, et cetera, that would uh, historically be uh, indications of an insider threat not so much as some kind of targeting of a particular person, but rather to try to learn are there things about the way we operate that you know, create undue risk, undue stress, um, undue vulnerabilities. And so I think that's part of it. Uh, I do think, I, I reject the idea that creativity and security, uh, that it's a binary thing. I think you can have innovation and security at the same time. Sometimes the distance between point A and point B is a little more circuitous and cumbersome. Uh, but having to deal with security, while it might be more of a challenge, I don't think should and needs to stifle innovation. And we talk a lot, and I'm talking a lot already in my first month, about the need for innovation, which is not something government has historically been very good at, trying to encourage people to bring up new ideas. It doesn't mean they should be out experimenting uh, you know, in some rogue fashion, but there is a way and a, a place and a time for people to try to put forward new ideas, and we need to be receptive to new ideas, or we're going to have the same kind of mission kill that Mike's talking about. On the leak front, um, that's something that's a deep concern, I think, to all of us on this stage. Um, we're focused on it from a perspective of, uh, while rec respecting very much the role of the people in your industry, uh, and the important role that a free press plays in our society. My experience, having done a lot of leak investigations when I was in government before, more often than not, the leaks are not coming from somebody who is in the inside circle of knowledge in the first instance. What happens is person A in government walks down the hall and tells person B about what just happened in the meeting or on the conversation, and then person B talks to person C and then through a couple layers of hearsay, then somebody's talking to a reporter. And so I think, you know, respecting the importance of need to know, which is a, you know, a, a tenet and a, a, a critical premise of uh, the system of classified 
information that we have, I think is something that we would all benefit from thinking back about and just having that shared sense of accountability and responsibility for the information that we're all entrusted with. Thank you. I'm glad to hear the new director of the FBI speak about the importance of a free press in addition to your concern about, uh, about leaks. I want to go to a question from the audience, uh, which uh, I found fascinating, and I'm really curious to hear the answers. Uh, the subject line is disruptive technologies, and the question is, what is the single most disruptive technology affecting your agency's missions, and how are you dealing with it? How can industry help? And maybe Director Cardillo would, would start off with that. Sure. So um, here's what I talked about our pride in our agency and our history. Part of that history includes decades of trained, um, conditioned, labeled data sets. It's, it's what we have done for a long time. It's what we do today. In a world that's moving quickly into artificial intelligence, computer learning, that's fuel for that disruptive technology. Uh, one of the things we're exploring now with the Hill uh, is an idea we have to take advantage of these government data sets, find a way to compete them fairly amongst this room for those that could apply the most innovative algorithm or application or computer vision or learning uh, application. Uh, and then we'd cross level. Uh, I'd share those, uh, that fuel, uh, you'd share the engine, if you will, uh, and, and we'd both benefit. Uh, so that's one way that we're trying to, to, to deal with this disruptive technology. But if I could add one more thing on AI that gives me great pause um, is, is the A, artificial. The bedrock of our profession is credibility, is trust. And I walk into a room and I say, hey boss, I've got some artificial intelligence for you. <laughs> really? <laughs> you can imagine, uh, we need to deal with what's real, what's not, right? What's the veracity, what's the, what's the pedigree, where did you get that data from, et cetera. We all have that challenge. So, I would just encourage the room as we all race necessarily to this AI future, because it's going to be here, we've got to hold on to credibility <laughs> uh, or we'll lose uh, our lifeblood. Uh, any, uh, Deputy Director Cavelli, any thoughts about the, the, the great disruption that's just over the next hill that uh, you're, you're worrying about at NRO? There's a disruption, but I'm not too worried about it. We're actually taking advantage of it, which is really the small set revolution, the, the CubeSats. And what we're finding is it's an amazing opportunity to test new things out very rapidly, very quickly, whether that's new materials to lightweight cables, whether it's a next generation of solar cells, but it provides a, a vessel, so you know, this, this CubeSat type bus that can go up in multiple sizes to actually get things on orbit for testing extremely quickly. It could also allow us to test out new sensors, new capabilities, so it's been disruptive in a positive way. The second thing that's been disruptive, which is actually really kind of cool, is launch. Um, we mentioned uh, earlier that uh, we launched our first satellite on SpaceX booster uh, just this past May 1st, but the, 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 all the new entrance into launch and commercial launch has really been a very positive disruption to, uh, that allows us more opportunities and more things to get systems on orbit. And Admiral Rogers, let me just ask something that's been in the news. Um, uh, Elon Musk, one of our leading uh, entrepreneurs, uh, has warned, as some other technologists have, that he sees in uh, artificial intelligence, uh, in the world of machine learning, uh, immense danger. And he just recently was quoted as saying he sees a threat of a third world war in AI systems that, that just spin out of control. What do you think about that, about that argument, that AI poses a real threat that we're not thinking carefully enough about? Now, it, it certainly represents a challenge. My, my view is, look, it all depends. Where do you decide that the man or woman needs to be involved in this process? And I have seen this in my own naval career. In my career in the United States Navy, we, in, we actually built unmanned engine rooms 30 years ago. But we decided the risk of not having an individual walking, to, walking around, taking a look at bilges, looking at oil, looking at leaks, 
fires. We just decided, look, we got the technology, we can do this, but the risk is really too high. Likewise, um, we've invented, we're fighting combat systems that are rules-based. You put the rules in and the system will, from tracking, analyzing, and engaging, based on the rule set that you have programmed in the system, it'll do everything automatically. We, based on experience, came to the conclusion, so where do we need to retain the man in the loop? What part of this equation where the risk gets to an unacceptable level? So as I look at artificial intelligence, it's the same thing to me. I don't see us abrogating everything to a machine. I see us asking ourselves, so where does this technology make sense in terms of risk and capability versus where is the risk so high that we would say to ourselves, even though we technically could do it, we don't like the risk and we don't think it's acceptable and we don't think it's in our best interest, we're not gonna do that. So I'm not quite in the same place because to me that comes across as, well, we're just gonna be unthinking and turn everything you know, um, over to a machine. And I just don't see it that way personally. I'm gonna turn to the question of counterterrorism, uh, which has been discussed earlier today. Uh, your agencies spend billions of dollars on uh, high-tech uh, answers to this problem, to, to maintain surveillance, to protect the nation. What we're seeing as we look at Europe is that our uh, terrorist adversaries' best weapon these days is a, is a van careening down a, a street or a sidewalk. And so there's obviously a concern that, that there's a mismatch between uh, what we've spent so much money uh, to do and the kinds of threats that are coming at us, and in particular, I think a concern about whether uh, we have the ability to detect the, uh, the homegrown, so-called lone wolf uh, threat uh, here at home. It isn't uh, organized by a, a, a network that, that uh, can uh, be targeted by surveillance. Director Ray, let me ask you to, to, to begin and uh, talk about, are, are you comfortable with our ability to avoid the really terrible problems that uh, Europe is facing now. What are, you, what are you doing about that? What should we be doing more? I mean, I, I do think that's the right question to ask. The, I think the threat has, I don't know if I would say evolved or degenerated from solely the more uh, classic, complex, structured, uh, you know, large cell terrorist operations, uh, you know, that, for example, led to 9-11 and, and various, so those plots are still there. But now this, the kinds of plots, the kinds of attacks that you're talking about, uh, in some ways they're simpler, but in some ways they're more complicated. They're simpler in the sense that you're talking about uh, fewer people involved in a particular attack, easier access to whatever the weapon is, more choice of soft targets as opposed to large spectacular um, you know, ones. And, but most importantly, much shorter time between the idea and the attack. You know, we used to talk about a terrorist plot having this continuum from the idea to then the planning to the preparation, the fundraising, all the way to the execution and the desire to uh, detect and prevent it somewhere along that continuum. Well, if the lifespan is much shorter, which it is with a lot of these home, homegrown uh, violent extremist types of situations, the need for us as a community uh, to be more agile, which is a word you heard, I think several of, uh, of my fellow panelists use, is much greater. Uh, and so to me, am I comfortable that we're there? We are working, a lot of it's working with our partners overseas, working with each other, working with state and locals, but it ties into something that Mike mentioned earlier that I, I want to just reinforce, which is the importance of 702. I mean, the place that 702 is most important is in our ability to detect and prevent plots when in that tiny window that's getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, and, and over and over again, that's where we see it being useful. Um, you know, that's the, that's the tool that enabled us to you know, detect, for example, an ISIS uh, uh, you know, proponent who was recruiting via social media people here in the U.S. focused on killing, uh, you know, American servicemen and women, American law enforcement, uh, would not have been possible without 702. Uh, that's a tool that, it, it, you know, helped us 
uh, detect and prevent the New York subway plot from a few years ago. Uh, and they're example after example. So as the, as the threat becomes more condensed, more ability for the adversary to call an audible and switch from a car to a gun to a knife to something else, uh, our ability to pounce during the, the, the critical window um, depends on that tool, I think, in large part. Just, David, can I make one other Sir. comment? I think part of the challenge here is be leery of being like kids to a soccer ball and going after the latest manifestation. Even as, for example, we have been seeing these lone wolf-like scenarios play out in Europe, in the exact same time frame, we just dealt with one of the most complex aviation threats we have ever seen in terms of what happened in Australia and Sydney. So one of the things I talked to our team about is, guys, we have got to optimize ourselves to deal with the spectrum. We've got to be able to go from that lone wolf individual all the way up to these very complex, multi-layered, time-consuming, very intricate. It isn't the extremes on either end. It's guys, we have got to be capable of generating insights across the spectrum. So we're always a little bit leery when, every, when I will sometimes hear, so it's totally evolved and it's all this. Mm, it's this spectrum, guys, and we've got to be capable of dealing with this spectrum. Just a thought. Let me just come back to Director Ray with, with one more uh, question. One of the uh, real challenges for the FBI and for local uh, law enforcement is, is to be in good contact with Muslim communities, to have regular dialogue so that uh, it, when people see something, they will say something, uh, and you'll have uh, some early notice. Uh, we're in a period of, of a pretty polarized debate about issues in our, in our country. Are you comfortable with, with that, the degree of interaction that the FBI has, and is that something that you'd like to work more on? I think the FBI, in my experience, this was true uh, in the period after 9-11, and it remains very much true now, largely through the JTTFs around the country, but not exclusively. I think it's very focused on you know, building ties in all the communities it protects, uh, and both from a perspective of uh, developing sources, but for other reasons. Um, so the, I think putting aside the the sort of more visible public political discourse, down on the ground, out in the front lines, uh, at the professional level, I think, in my experience, FBI and state and local law enforcement do a pretty good job of um, having it both ways. In other words, building the relationships, but at the same time, you know, being tough where tough is what's warranted. So I, I want to go to a, a very practical question uh, from the audience. Um, there can't be a, a person in the room who hasn't worried about this. Uh, the question is, what can be done to fix the security clearance process <laughs> so the community and its industry partners can hire talented personnel? At a breakout session yesterday, speakers asserted that 700,000 applicants are waiting for clearances. Why is it so hard just to get a person's clearance transferred from one agency to another. Uh, obviously, this is something that our audience uh, is deeply interested in. Uh, Deputy Director Driscoll, do you want to lead off on this question? I'd uh, love to hear from, from any of our panelists who have thoughts. So we all, we ask the same thing. Why is it taking so long? Well, who do we have to call to get this, this person cleared through? Um, I don't know how to solve that. Uh, it, it, and it's how much, it's back to the risk issue. How much risk are you willing to, are we willing to take? And uh, how many checks and balances do we need to have in terms of clearing people? Who do we have to talk to? In terms of passing clearances, it's, it's a trust issue. It's a, as much as anything between agencies. It's also differences in, in um, the degree of, of uh, and I'll talk about polygraphs, for example, which is what we use. Everybody has to have a polygraph. Uh, when they come into DIA, but it's a certain kind of polygraph. Other agencies, it's a different kind of polygraph. There's a, there's a fundamental difference of opinion about vetting people and how the tool that they use to do that. So it starts there. If you don't use the same polygraph system that I do, or the, the, the questions, the way we do it, then we're at it you know, right off the bat. We, you know, we have to go back, go, kind of go back to the start point. So that's, for us, that's one, one area that we've run into when we've tried to do that. Any, any other panelists have a thought about what to do about this, uh, I don't want to use the word nightmare, 
lightly, but when you talk to people, uh, it, it sounds like one. What, uh, what do you think, think Director think, Padilla? I, I think part of the answer is continuous evaluation. Um, we're engaged now in the ODNI-led pilot uh, to introduce part of our workforce into this, this process. And again, I don't know that it'll fix the initial backload, which is what you just described, the people that are starting in line. But perhaps it will if, if we can reduce some of the what now is a periodic investigation line that consumes the same resources that perhaps we could dedicate to that initial vetting to make sure we get that core trust. And then if we can get the room's help again to do some of this in automation, some of this on what is more common in the commercial practice when people are trying to seek whether they're finances are being protected or their intellectual property is being protected. We have the same challenges, so I think the more that we can bring in that, uh, those types of applications, the better. I want to ask a, another very practical uh, business question uh, on, on acquisition reform. Uh, notes that INSA recently published a paper with recommendations for improving the IC's processes for acquiring services and expertise. How can your agencies make the cumbersome acquisition process more efficient. What can government and industry do differently? Uh, and uh, uh, Deputy Director, can I maybe start so, that off? So probably one of the most important things is uh, on, on the government side is we need to hold our timelines. We need to uh, be as 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 qu get through the process as as quickly as as we can, uh, including an Im the important process of oversight from external organizations like DNI and others. Those, they, they play a critical role in our success. But I think uh, another big thing that we really need on acquisition side is that we get really good quality proposals from industry. I think the, as you, when you get really good quality proposals in-house, the process goes a lot smoother. And if you end up having to go back out for questions, answers, discussion, rewrites, it just drags the process on. So I think there are ways to streamline things in the upfront to get RFPs out the door, but I think it's really also critical that realistic proposals with good technical information and realistic cost proposals come back in is really key to success and speeding the process as well. Yeah, I could ask Director Cardillo to talk a, a little bit about the, the, your idea for having, in effect, a brokerage scheme to, to share uh, ideas between NGA and, and, uh, and the world of companies in this room that are developing algorithms and ways to deal with data. Yeah, I briefly mentioned it earlier, and the, the basic proposition is pretty simple. The implementation I'm finding is pretty complex, but it's, it's that we have these extant data sets uh, that uh, we believe there's high value in as you move to computer learning. Um, we'd like to find a way to make those uh, competitively available to you. Uh, we'd like to see if we could exchange uh, for that access uh, your innovative application of the same data. Um, if I could just pile on, though, too, to, the, to, to Frank's answer is that part of what we'll always buy stuff and we'll always buy, you know, hardware and software because we're large uh, uh, enterprises that need both. Uh, I think over time we're also going to add to that more services, uh, which, which I believe should be part of the answer to your question on agility. And so... We, we're now in our second year of experimenting with a GSA-like approach uh, to where you would um, vet and, and get uh, accredited with GSA for your services, again, to the broker model. We would then use, once you had that approval, it would be more of a transaction-like um, uh, exchange, which would have gone through all of the requirements that Frank talked about, but then once at the point of need, you could you could have the interaction much more quickly. Can I, David, can I have one other thing on this? You know, NRO represents acquisition as a core skill set. It's probably the biggest slice of your budget goes in acquisition. Right. For the rest of us, acquisition not quite the same, at least speaking for the organization that I'm a part of at NSA, one of the things I've talked to the team about is we've got to step back and ask ourselves, what can we do to make acquisition a core skill set for us as an organization? That historically, that has just not been the norm. I would argue for most of us outside of NRO, that just hasn't been really the norm. That's an area where I think within the IC, we can significantly improve. Um, the other thing is, it's, it's all relative. As a guy who straddles the Cyber Command, a very traditional DOD entity, with the up until very recently, we were just granted additional acquisition authority, but prior to that, 
<laughs> living in the DOD acquisition world as a military operational command and living in the IC, you know, in the acquisition world, I kid all my IC counterparts, boy, we got it a whole lot better than, than our DOD traditional military counterparts. I have a whole lot more authority and capacity in many ways for acquisition as an IC leader than I do as a you know, senior military commander in the DOD. A question from the audience that is of, of special relevance for Director Ray. Um, the question, questioner asks, what is the extent of Russian influence operations in the United States as well as in Europe? How confident are you that the IC understands Russian plans and intentions? That's a nice, simple question. Yeah, just give exactly. us a yes or no. All right, that's right. Very? No, just <laughs> kidding. Um, you know, I would say that um, from the information that I've read, I mean, I, I read obviously the unclassified ICA when I was going through the confirmation process. Now I've had the opportunity uh, to see a lot more uh, fully, highly classified information. Uh, and the, it, the ICA is, I think you're referring to the January 6th correct. intelligence community correct. assessment of uh, Russian activities during the 2016 election. And I guess I would say, uh, I said then, and I'd say now, I have no reason to doubt the conclusions uh, that the hardworking people who put that together came to. Um, I do know there's, there's an enormous amount of attention focused on this issue. I think a lot of people have taken it very seriously. Um, you know, I'm reluctant ever to say that we have our arms fully around any risk or threat. Uh, as anybody who's had involvement with surveillance of different sorts, whether it's technical surveillance or physical surveillance, um, it's extraordinarily resource intensive. You start running into the prioritization. Uh, that's not the word that Mike used in a different context in the, in the counterterrorism arena, but it's the same issue. You know, how do you distinguish when uh, when different kinds of threats, even in the counterintelligence arena, aren't going away? Just new ones are getting added. How do you make the human judgments uh, to prioritize this one versus that one, since you can't cover everything all the time? And that's something I worry about. Uh, but I think it's it's a known risk that I think people are, are trying to deal with. Question uh, from the audience for Admiral Rogers. How concerned are you about the cyber security of the Navy's fleet? Could cyber attacks have had anything to do with the two recent collisions involving US Navy vessels? Is the Navy more generally prepared for cyber attacks on operational assets? So there's an ongoing effort to review and assess that in the case of the John S. McCain uh, situation. We've had the CNO already speak out publicly about that. I'm not, although I'm a Navy Admiral, I'm not going to speak for the United States Navy in this case. I will say that the, the analogy that I drew with the cyber enterprise was, guys, welcome to a world in which the ability to say that cyber was or was not a factor in an accident or a situation, that's the world we're living in now. So how do we work our way through the processes that we're gonna put in place? You're seeing this play out in the John S. McCain scenario, but how are we gonna put in place the means to ensure that cyber expertise is a part of our normal investigative processes as we try to assess, how did we lose that aircraft? How was that ship damaged? Um, th this is the world that we're living in now, and traditionally, it hasn't been a primary part of our thought process, but the digital age is driving us. So I have a, a business question that I think will be of special interest to people from smaller and medium-sized companies uh, in the audience about uh, innovation. Innovative technology companies have a hard time working through the federal procurement process. How effectively has the IC incorporated cutting-edge technologies from startups and other small tech companies? To what degree have entities like Incutel, uh, IARPA, and DIUX helped in this regard. What advice would you give small tech companies trying to cut through the red tape? Uh, Director Cardillo, do you want to start, start on that? Sure, I mean, I think the broad answer is, I think we're doing better than we were and not as good as we need to be. And, and so, you know, we've already talked about some of the adjustments we've tried to make to lower the barrier. And one of the barriers is 
to smaller companies with less established access and perhaps a, a foot in the door, if you will, if not more. So you mentioned DIUX and InQtel. We've, we've now established what we call NGA outposts, where we realize some of these companies, one, might not know that we exist, might, if they knew we exist, don't know where we live, three, might not know that they should care about either of those things. And so we've decided to move uh, to where they are. And, uh, you know, of course that means Silicon Valley, but it also means Austin and St. Louis and Boston and New York. And so we're, we're putting out our, our scouts, if you will, to, to begin those conversations in a way that perhaps they weren't having before. But I'll, I'll end with, we know we can do better here. Deputy Director Calvelli, you think a lot about about this. How, how can uh, NRO, huge, uh, cutting edge agency, super secret? How does it deal with that world of, of the small company, the startup? So what's really great is on the R and D side. A lot of the R and D that we do is unclassified. So we've been doing something for 20 years called the Director's Innovation Initiative that we publicize in media. We put it out. Um, out there in the news, we, uh, we take uh, unclassified from academia, from uh, industry, from any unclassified firm that's out there that wants, has innovative ideas that could help us in terms of our mission. We fund a half dozen of those a year, and the good ones end up eventually becoming classified and onto some of our space or ground systems. Uh, we're also trying innovative things like um, our, our ground director recently put out a, uh, an RFP, unclassified, and we asked only for like an eight minute video back as opposed to proposal, you know, and you don't have to worry about a cost volume or things like that. And, 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 and then we awarded like four or five contracts based upon that. So we're always looking for innovative ways, but there are lots of ways out there that we get through, especially in the R&D side of the house that are unclassified and they're open to everybody. So I want to ask a, a last uh, a question and I, I'm going to direct, direct it to Deputy Director Driscoll, uh, who's worked in different places in the, in the IC. And, and the question is this. What advice do you have for the new generation starting work at your agencies? What skills and experiences must young people have to succeed? Uh, how can you improve the hiring process? How can agencies compete for talent with contractors and tech firms when it takes more than a year for an applicant to get a security clearance? What, do you, what, do you, what, what advice for, for, for young would-be IC members? Well, um, we do really cool work, so... <laughs> uh, Please stick with us. Um, for us, we are trying to, so for DI, we know that the security clearance is part of the process. We're doing what we can on both ends to shorten that time frame. What we're looking for, and what I would tell them is, um, I talked to you before, but we're looking for really inquisitive people. Really smart, that goes without saying, but really inquisitive. And, um, and come in, and I found that, come in and ask lots of questions, and challenge people to explain what they're doing and why they do it, and and there are w better ways to do it, um, and yeah, and just be patient. And uh, we have an obligation to set expectations. I think Admiral Rogers talked about that. What we expect from people, but um, yeah, just come and, and be prepared to do really cool work. I we right, try to so assure them of that all the time. With that I invitation to come do uh, cool work, we should bring our our panel to an end. This is a rare opportunity to have such a high level uh, talent running uh, such important agencies all on the stage. Please join me in thanking them for being with us. Thank you.